Welcome back to this series on neural network programming with PyTorch. In this video, we will see how to work with the data set and data loader PyTorch classes. Our goal in this video is to get comfortable working with these classes, as well as to get a feel for the data inside our training set. Without further ado, let's get started. From a high level perspective, we are still in the preparing data stage of our deep learning project. In this video, we're going to see how we can work with the data set and data loader objects that we created in a previous video. Remember, we have two PyTorch objects, a data set and a data loader. We called the data set variable train set and we called the data loader variable train loader. Now that we're all set, let's kick things off in a notebook with our imports. torch, torch vision, and transforms from within the torch vision package. Our train set is an instance of the fashion in this class that also lives inside the torch vision package. In the constructor, we specify the directory where the data is located on disk, that we want the data to be the training data, that the data should be downloaded if it doesn't already exist on disk, and finally, we define a transform that should be performed on our data elements. The compose class allows us to create a composition of transformations. In this case, we are just turning our data into a tensor, which is a single transformation. For the train loader, we are using the data loader constructor and passing the train set along with a batch size of 10. Note that we didn't specify a batch size in the last video, but we're doing it here so we can see more images when we begin working with actual batches. The default size is one if we don't specify an alternative here. All right, let's look at some operations we can perform to better understand our data. First, we have to import a couple more packages. We've imported NumPy, and we've also imported PyPlot from within matplotlib. The first line of code here that's not an import just sets the line width for PyTorch output that is printed to the console. We use the Python lin function to see how many images are in our training set. And as we would expect, this 60,000 number makes sense based on what we learned in the post about the fashion in this data set. If you haven't seen that video where we cover the fashion in this data set and the importance of data and deep learning in general, I highly recommend you check that one out. The next piece of code gives us the label tensor for the data set. The first image is a nine and the next two are zeros. Remember from post past, these values encode the actual class name or label. The nine, for example, represents an ankle boot, while the zero represents a t-shirt. The next call to bin count is pretty interesting. Essentially, we can create bins and then count the frequency of occurrences within each bin. We can call bin count on a label tensor and it will give us the frequency distribution of the values inside the tensor. This shows us that the fashion in this data set is uniform with respect to the number of samples from each class. As a result, this data set is said to be balanced. If the classes had a varying number of samples, we would call the set an unbalanced data set. Yeah, so in general, you know, your validation set and test set need to have the same mix or frequency of observations that you're going to see in production in the real world. Um, and then your training set should have um, an equal number in each class. And if you don't, just replicate the less common one until it is equal. So this is, I think we've mentioned this paper before, a very recent paper that came out that tried lots of different approaches to training with unbalanced data sets and found consistently that oversampling the less common class until it is the same size as the more common class is always the right thing to do. Um, so you could literally copy 
you know, so like I've only got a thousand, uh, you know, ten examples of people with cancer and a hundred without, so I could just copy those ten another, you know, ninety times. Um, that's kind of a little memory inefficient, uh, so a lot of um, things, including I think SK Learns random forests, have a class weights parameter, um, or ditto if you're doing deep learning. You know, make sure in your mini batch it's not randomly sampled, but it's a stratified sample, so the less common class is picked more often. Jeremy briefly mentioned a paper. It's this one. A systematic study of the class imbalance problem in convolutional neural networks. We can see the reference here in the abstract to oversampling. And if we jump into the paper and search for best method, we'll find this. Regarding performance of different methods for addressing imbalance, in almost all of the situations, oversampling emerged as the best method. The authors elaborate further on this in the paper's conclusion section. Check this out if you're interested to learn more. The link to this one is on the blog post for this video on deeplizard.com. Class imbalance is a common problem, but in our case, we have just seen that the fashion MNIST dataset is indeed balanced. So we don't have to worry about this with our project. Let's see now how we can access one of our data samples in code. To access an individual element from the train set object, we first pass the train set object to Python's built-in iter function, which returns an object representing a stream of data that we can then iterate over. With the stream of data, we can use Python's built-in next function to get the next data element in the stream. From this call, we are expecting to get a single sample, so we named the result accordingly. After checking the length of the sample, we can see that the sample contains two items. Hmm, this is kind of strange. What's going on here? Well, this is because the dataset contains image label pairs. Each sample that we retrieve from the training set contains the image data as a tensor and the corresponding label as a tensor. Since the sample is a Python sequence type, we can use a concept known as sequence unpacking to assign the image and the label. This is a shortcut for accessing each item in the sequence using its index. So instead of writing these two lines of code, we just write this one line. This shortcut is called sequence unpacking or list unpacking. You may also hear this as deconstructing the object. Let's look at some more code. We'll check the shape for both the label and the image, and we'll also plot the image. But first, before we do this, I want you to think about the shapes of these tensors. Try and figure out what you think the shape for each of these, the image and the label, will be. Opposed to RGB images that have three color channels, grayscale images have a single color channel. Since we are dealing with grayscale images, this is why we have one channel with height and width of 28. The label is a scalar value, and so we have a scalar value tensor with no shape, which is what this empty array here represents. To plot the image, we use the image show function. We pass the image tensor with the color channel axis squeezed off. And for the color map parameter, we pass gray for grayscale. Also, just below, we are printing the label, which in this case is a nine. This is what we expect given the fact that we see an ankle boot in the plot. All right, so let's see how to work with batches and the data loader now. All of the code here for the batch is nearly identical to what we saw for the single sample. We pass the train loader instance to the iter function and we use the next function to get the next batch. Then we unpack the batch into two variables. Since we are dealing with a batch, this time we are using the plural forms for our variable names, images and labels, to indicate the fact that we expect to have multiple of each. Before we check the shape of these two tensors, pause the video and see if you can figure it out for yourself. 
The tensor containing the images is a rank four tensor with a shape of 10 by one by 28 by 28. This tells us that we have 10 images that have a single color channel with a height and width of 28. For the tensor containing the labels, we have a rank one tensor whose single axis has a length of 10. Running along this axis, we have labels, one for each of the 10 images in our batch. Let's see now how we can plot the whole batch of images at once using the TorchVision make grid utility function. Just like that, we're looking at a new wardrobe. At the top, we can see that we've created a grid using the torch vision make grid utility function. We pass the images tensor as the first argument and for the in row parameter, we pass 10 so that all of our images will be displayed along a single row. The in row parameter specifies the number of images in each row. Since our batch size is 10, this gives us a single row of images. After we have the grid, we specify some PyPlot configurations and we use NumPy to transpose the grid so that the axes meet the specifications the image show function requires. We also print the labels here so we can verify for ourselves that the data is as it should be. Remember, we have the following table that shows us the label mappings to each of the class names. We should now have a good understanding of how to explore and interact with data sets and data loaders. Both of these will prove to be important as we begin building our convolutional neural network and our training loop. In fact, the data loader will be used directly inside our training loop as we are iterating over our data during the training process. So here's a fun fact. If you wanna see more data at once, try increasing the batch size on the data loader. And be sure to check out deeplizard.com where you can see the blog post for this video and give the deep lizard hive mind a look where you can get deep lizard perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to collective intelligence. I'll see you in the next one. Imagine this, you wake up in the morning and you take a breath of fresh air. And you smell bacon, eggs, toast, coffee, your favorite breakfast already made for you and you didn't even have to go to bed. So then you get up and you go into your kitchen and you indulge yourself. But as you're eating, a screen pops up with your day already planned out for you. And you didn't lift a finger. So then as per your schedule, you get up and you head into your car. And as you open up the car door, you realize something there's actually not even any seats. In fact, there's not even a steering wheel, just a couch for you to lay down on. So you do. As you lay down, the car takes off, already knowing where your work is without you having to say a thing. So as it's speeding along the road, you're talking to someone. Although you're not just talking to anyone, you're talking to a friend the same friend that had made your breakfast this morning, planned your schedule, and is driving the car right now. And as you're talking to them, you're talking to them through a computer. Although through isn't really the right word, because your friend is the actual computer.